Hello, and welcome to another edition of Unicorn Chef. This is a momentous milestone for us. Our first returning chef, the very first one that was there when we kicked it all off, Lena Dork Phoenix Terrazas. Oh. Uh, and so, first. Hello and welcome to another edition of oh, that's Unicorn me. Chef. This wow. is. A momentous milestone. That's funny to hear myself back there because I had the YouTube channel up. All right. Um, so remember, for everybody at home, logistics, you can interact with us through the YouTube chat. Um, we'll be able to see that. And if you put out a really good comment, we'll put it across the screen. Um, tonight's charities are the lastmile.org or the veteran community project.org. There it is up on the screen. Please donate. Uh, Lena, why did you pick these? Uh, I picked both of those charities because they're near and dear to my heart, um, and I've been involved with both of them. Um, Veterans Community Project is a locally based, started in Kansas City charity, uh, and they've since expanded to multiple cities. And the last mile uh, was something, actually both uh, charities were things that I was not aware of until very recently, but have been around for a little while. So um, I think their missions are, are both incredibly important. Um, and I'm happy to support them. So please donate to those two charities. I will, of course, gab endlessly about both of those charities while we cook, if you'd like. And what are we drinking tonight? Uh, my usual these days, uh, French martini. So it is two parts Chambord. I'm sorry, one part Chambord, two parts pineapple juice, and two parts vodka. I happen to use Kettle One this evening. Sounds good. I am drinking a Goose Island IPA. Nope. All right, Lena, the kitchen is yours. Awesome. So we are, as Bryson previously announced, going to make carne asada fries this evening. Um, this recipe was originally not mine. It's a tasty.com recipe. As with most of my recipes, I found it on Pinterest. Um, I have, however, made some alterations, uh, and so I'll call those out as we go along. But uh, even if you stick with the OG recipe, you're going to be pleased. I think um, I have been. I just compulsively change all the recipes once I've made them a couple times. So that is what we are cooking. What I have done so far to start prepping is jack my oven to 425. It takes 100 friggin' years to heat up. So hopefully by the time we're done with the show, it will actually be appropriately hot enough to cook these fries. Um, the steak... I did go ahead and put in to marinate yesterday because I am a sucker for uh, a nice marinade in tenderizing meat. Um, so that mixture has been published with the recipe as well. Uh, but off the top of my head, it's orange juice, lime juice, uh, I want to say cumin, uh, definitely garlic. I, I definitely usually uh, shortcut garlic and salt into garlic salt. Um, I have since made alterations to the original recipe and added Italian dressing and soy sauce. So if you follow my altered recipe, I would recommend using garlic powder instead of garlic salt so that you don't make the whole job too salty. Because um, soy sauce obviously is pretty salty on its own. Cilantro, um, minced garlic, some other things you'll see in the recipe. But this has been marinating since yesterday. Um, I happen to use ribeye this time. I've made it with sirloin. I've made it with flank steak. Um, really, as long as it's a meat of your choice that's been marinating for 24 hours, I think I'd be happy. So, uh, while the oven is preheating, I will also very often grill this. Um, tonight, I'm just going to make it on the stove and pan sear it. Um, but I would have started the oven, then gone outside and used my chimney to start the grill. Um, or at least to get the charcoal going until it's nice and ashed over and ready to pour into the grill and cook some things on. Um, since both of those things take about 30 minutes, once you get the potatoes done in the oven, they're going to bake for about 31 to 35 minutes. Um, and then on the grill, usually takes a good 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes tops for my chimney to get the coals ready. Uh, then I'll put the lid on and let it heat up um, ambient temperature inside the grill. Um, and then I'll go put the steak on it a couple minutes each side. I like my meat rare and then um, I'll pull it off and let it rest for another 10 minutes. So the times end up about matching up with when the potatoes are done. 
Um, in this case, we're just going to pan sear and then maybe drink and chat while we wait for the potatoes to cook. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of all that grill action. That sounds good. I mean, a little grill on grill action is always a good thing, though. <laughs> do you remember when I lusted after your smoker? I do. I will never forget it. We'll never forget it. I know you. You were, you were jokingly very it. upset. I think you were joking that you were upset. Yes, yes, yes. It was just sad and pathetic that someone was hitting on my smoker and not on me. Uh, I wasn't hitting on your smoker. I was lusting after it. Okay, right. You weren't hitting on it because it's an inanimate object, and that was very strange. But were it not, you would have been. Uh, so the recipe calls for russet potatoes. I'm a bigger fan of red potatoes, so that's what I used. Um, so follow your potato dreams. Um, don't let the recipe paint you into a potato corner. Recipe also calls for just standard olive oil. Um, I like, uh, as in all things, to be a little bit extra. So I like to use uh, infused olive oils. This one is roasted garlic. So that's what I'm gonna use because I love garlic and put it in all things arguably too much of it but it's for me and i love garlic so to that we're going to add all the spices in the recipe um, again slight slight not not huge deviation from the original recipe i'm going to use garlic salt cayenne pepper chili powder oh my oven's ready yes um smoked paprika because i can't just use regular paprika and then um, this I may not use a ton of. It's a like an all-purpose garlic, onion, black pepper, and sea salt blend. It allows me to be lazy and pull out one bottle instead of five bottles sometimes. So I compulsively grab it. So we've got the olive oil in here with the potatoes. We're going to add as much as suits your fancy. I know the recipe calls for this. I'm bad at it. So I don't bother. I mean, not that I can't measure, it's not difficult, but I'm much more of a fly by the seat of your pants kind of gal. So we won't be doing that. So what, what kind of mood are you in when you cook this? I mean, cause to me, this seems like a really like cool comfort food. Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, I just, I tried it on a whim. So often I will just, I don't know about you, but I will buy a bunch of ingredients that could be four or five or six different things that I made before. And then we see how I'm feeling that particular day. This is a nice warm in your belly kind of a meal. So I'm already getting this on myself. I might actually put on my apron just for you. <laughs> and to protect the cashmere. Definitely protect the cashmere. Uh, yeah, uh, as Ben is noting in the comments, um, for those of you who watch the show, we wing all of the ingredients. Everything is just kind of what it feels. And that's one of the good fun things about cooking is you can just kind of taste it as you go and adjust. Also, dinner is coming. Right. Now I won't get it all over myself, or I will, and it won't matter. See, I can't. I, I need to get mine adjustable. My my apron needs to be like here, but it's like here. I see that you got the adjustable one. Yes. Yes. We just must protect the shelf, as we discussed in group chat the other day. Some of us larger busted ladies, the shelf catches all things. So as long as I'm at least shelf high, I should be good. At least as far as my laundry load is concerned. Nope. All right. Let me stir this up. Park. Yes, I will burp on camera. Well, all right. So just, you could shake it up. Uh, if you have a large enough mixing bowl, uh, my larger mixing bowl is needing to be washed because I made cake last night. It has not been eaten by me yet. My younger brother came off on his night shift and helped himself. But this was supposed to be either a celebration presidential victory cake or a sadness cake. Either way, eaten with a spoon over the stove. My brother's had a piece already, but it is there. The mix larger mixing bowl is dirty, so the smaller one, I don't have as much space to be shaking things to blend, so I stirred that one up a little bit. 
you should be able to just toss it in the mixture of business. And that's also a good way to get the oil coating um, evenly distributed through. Yes, indeed. Um, I like parchment paper when I'm baking things uh, that I don't really want to scrub off of a pan later. Um, I favor this pre-cut because, again, I'm lazy uh, maybe, and sell at my local grocery store so I don't even have to cut my own parchment paper. I, I need to use the parchment paper here because um, oh, I did a little bit of oil and my fries are already sticking. Yes, uh, they will stick to aluminum foil, they will stick to a pan, even with oil coating. Um, and I also feel like they crisp up a little bit better on parchment paper. Uh, I, I don't know if that's some sort of effect of the parchment paper on its roasting process. I've not bothered to research this. It just keeps me from having to scrub pans. But I, I have found that it seems to crisp them up evenly and then they come right off the parchment paper when I'm done. Uh, I don't have to fight them. All right, Coolio. So we got all this jazz on the parchment paper. We're going to bake, like I said, 31 to 35 minutes. Uh, and then we will see to the steak. All right. So we will take our marinated steak out. Uh, I try to take it out of the fridge at least 30 minutes, preferably an hour um, before cooking time. So it has a chance to warm up a little bit, um, makes it cook more evenly. So if you do marinate your steak or anytime you're pulling meat out of the fridge, I always suggest take it out a little early. Let it acclimate. Uh, I'm going to use cast iron pans for this. So I did something a little different. I um, have already beaded my steak, so I put it back in the fridge because uh, for a sous vide to get a crust afterwards, it actually helps for it to be colder to get that as opposed to room temperature. Oh, hang on. That I did not know. I have never used a sous vide as it as it sounds. I, uh, I have not been using it for long, but I had a guest on um, a couple months ago, Chris Villasenor, and he did the sous vide. So I bought a sous vide explicitly for that episode, and now I've been experimenting with it. experimentation we can do. All right. Actually, I'm going to use the name of the oil that I have out. Roasted garlic infused. I've got a teensy tiny bit of... Teensy tiny. Uh, <laughs> You will find that um, this steak, because it's been marinating and is, uh, normally speaking, you would take meat out of the fridge and then pat it dry to try to get a, a good sear or good grill marks on it. Um, in this case, because it is just stopping full of this marinade, just don't be upset or overcook it in the interest of trying to get a nice uh, black sear on it because it's probably not going to happen. And you're just going to end up with well done meat. Which to me is the worst thing ever. On par with human trafficking. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Please, no hey, one. hey, too soon, too soon. Yeah, right. Is it always going to be too soon for that? <laughs> That's actually happening. <laughs> yes, yes, accurate. All right. On par with Bryson's beard when he doesn't trim it. How about that? It's not offensive. Fair enough. For, for two more months, I am uh, going to be Moses. Yes, I forgot you had a time frame in mind. I do. I'm going to be doing a uh, charity fundraiser in December where everybody can choose what kind of ridiculous looks, cuts, costumes, you name it. I will do it. It's going to be on the honor system because I'm not going to be promoting a specific charity. I just want to promote charitable giving. At the end of the year, we should give back to those because um, – Yeah. A lot of us have been very fortunate that we, we've had the means to get through the difficult times that we've had, but that's not the case for everybody. So I just want to encourage that kind of giving back. Absolutely. And lose 15 pounds of hair. <laughs> it might be about that. So speaking of charity, I did say I want to talk a little bit more about um, the two charities featured, um, which again, I don't know if you're going to flash up the link ag again at a later point, but here, I'll put it back up right now. I was going to say, everyone on this uh, 
broadcast can likely Google uh, Veterans Community Project and The Last Mile, uh, you'll find lots of good stuff. So Veterans Community Project, they are a local Kansas City um, founded, and anything local Kansas City founded, I'm a sucker for. Um, in particular, their mission is a little bit different than a lot of other veteran outreach programs because um, they feel pretty strongly that they fill a gap in the system. They feel like they catch veterans that are neglected um, and maybe ignored by other programs. Um, I did not realize, not being a veteran myself, that uh, very often, even after successfully completing their duty, um, there are various reasons why uh, a vet would be denied benefits after no longer being a vet. Um, I also did not realize that the Coast Guard, no matter how long you serve, you get basically nothing uh, when you get out. And uh, I, I, all of that, the guys who founded Veterans Community Project found to be problematic. Um, and so they kind of feel that it's their mission to um, catch the vets who fell through the cracks, so to speak. Uh, probably the most visible part of their outreach is the Tiny Homes Project. Um, so there's a Tiny Homes Village here in Kansas City across from their headquarters um, that is made up of exactly that, tiny homes. So they're uh, a bedroom, a bathroom for the single units and a kitchen. Uh, they're actually very nice. Uh, I got to tour them. And then for the family units, they sleep, I think, up to four. Um, and they live there free of charge. Uh, but even though that's the most visible part of what they do, that's not a lot of what they do. A majority of what they do that is often overlooked um, has to do with just helping them as people, not just getting them off the street and into a warm bed, um, but helping them turn their lives around, so to speak. So they provide um, counseling services. They provide uh, everything from resume help um, to job placement services. Uh, they built and rehabbed their uh, HQ to include a barber shop and a laundromat um, and provide a lot of services to these guys that they uh, and gals that wouldn't get access to normally. Um, I got involved when I saw uh, Patrick Mahomes helping build tiny homes because as anyone who knows me knows, I am obsessed with the Kansas City Chiefs and I may or may not have a Google alert set up for Patrick Mahomes. So when that story hit the internet, I made the music on it and went, what's the Veterans Community Project? And went and checked them out. So all I did was lob them an email and say, hey, I work for Cisco. I'm here local to KC. I think what you guys are doing is great. What can we do to help? Uh, and they immediately responded and said, we need Wi-Fi. <laughs> because they were operating on some Best Buy grade uh, random BS that was in a closet. And uh, they also, uh, in the veteran or the tiny homes community across the street, were using a 4G LTE hotspot to provide internet to all of the tiny homes, um, which they've expanded greatly. There's a lot of them over there. They wanted some enterprise grade features like being able to um, set time limits on the password and have people have to come back and re-register and um, so that surrounding neighbors weren't using their internet. So there was, uh, they needed help. Um, we partnered with a, a local uh, uh, bar called Converge One, AOS Converge One with Alexander Open Systems. It's now Converge One, um, but they're still referred to as AOS Converge One. Uh, found a couple of vets that were in leadership possession, positions over there. And I said to them, look, I can get them gear, but my concern is ongoing support. Um, they don't really have an IT staff or an IT person. Um, and I, am, I worry that if I get them gear that they're not gonna be able to run it themselves. So uh, props to AOS Converge One for hopping in the boat and uh, helping stand up their Wi-Fi and keep them going long-term. So I don't know if you know this, I'm a disabled veteran and uh, I have, can speak to the fact that uh, for the most part, anybody, regardless of benefits or not, you pretty much fall through the cracks. Um, the, the benefits are there. I, I'll, I'll give a, I'll, so, so a personal story. Um, so when I was um, medically discharged back at the height of the war in 04, um, <clears throat> I was put into the VA system and uh, I would get email, I would get these, um, not emails, <laughs> 2004. I would get these letters to my house a month after my appointment. And they'd say, hey, your appointment is a month ago. And I'd be like, what? And I would go to, the, and so I would call them up and I'd be like, hey, like, uh, I just got this. Apparently I had a doctor's appointment I didn't know. When can I see the doctor? And I would, you know, it'd be like, oh, it's a three month wait. 
fine, whatever. And I would go in and they'd just be like, so what do you want? I'm like, um, I mean, I don't want pills or anything. Like, I don't really want anything from y'all. Like, like, okay, see you in a year. And then I would get my letter a month later <laughs> after my year appointment and then I would repeat. And that was all I ever got. Yeah, I, I didn't know that the system was that bad. Um, these guys also will help um, veterans navigate the system um, and understand what they are actually entitled to from a benefits perspective and help them get in touch for, with the right people um, and, you know, fill out the right forms and, you know, make sure that the bureaucracy doesn't prevent them from getting what they're entitled to as uh, having, you know, done their duty for our country. Uh, they have since become so popular, they've expanded to Denver. Um, they just, I think, broke ground in St. Louis. I read something about them creating a tiny homes village there. Um, so they've had folks reach out to them from all over the country. Like they, they just don't even have enough people to keep up with the demand because obviously uh, vets falling through the cracks, as Bryson pointed out, is not a pro problem that is local and exclusive to Kansas City. Um, so I think what they're doing is awesome. and. I met, I had the privilege of meeting several of those folks and uh, they, they were really just everyday vets um, who, you know, got out of the military and became lawyers and, uh, you know, architects and, and all this, this wide range of, of careers. And they just all came together and said, this isn't good enough. Uh, and we are going to have to solve the problem ourselves. And I think that's awesome. So in a nutshell, that's the Veterans Community Project. So please donate to them. If there's a local uh, version popping up in your area, feel free to donate to that one. Um, obviously, the problem is universal. I just, by the way, put the steak um, in my cast iron. It was hot enough. Um, and I went ahead and let it cook for a couple minutes while we were talking, and then I just flipped it. So I'm going to let it go a couple minutes. I like rare meat. Uh, medium rare is about as done as I'll ever get it. So, I had not even heated my pan yet, so I'm catching up now. <laughs> hey, it's still going to be delicious, whether it's done now or after the show. And i got 20 minutes left on these potatoes, so I'm probably even a bit premature. But I'm, I'm ahead on the potatoes, so I think, I, I, I think my timing might, might work out here. But I, I do appreciate highlighting the, the veteran charity, again, as a vet. Um, it's, it's not easy. Um, we... One, we get institutionalized. We're used to a very particular way of life and understanding how we, you know, everything. Um, and on one hand, I think that culturally is part of the problem that we have is that the military services are lionized and isolated. If I can be philosophical for a second, um, but back to like day to day living. When we get out, we really are all terrified. Like, we have no idea what normal civilian life is like. Like we talk about job opportunities, we don't know what those are. Um, and then on top of that, most of us are typically dealing with different kinds of medical issues. And that's the part where we're generally, I feel like left out in the cold. Yep. Yeah, I, uh, I floated the idea to the guys and I really liked it. Um, we hadn't, haven't taken any concrete action to do it yet, but I had suggested when they talked about resume help, I was like, well, what if we could bring some Cisco folks out here to teach like route switch or uh, basic IT skills um, in addition to the resume help and, you know, maybe help push some folks in a direction or give them the, the base knowledge that they might not be able to afford to go get at a community college or something like that, um, like maybe once a month, just some kind of mentorship program. So that's hopefully still something we'll be able to do long term. And then we'll um, talk about the last mile. So uh, the last mile uh, is another, you know, organization that I'm pre pretty passionate about uh, that I found sort of by accident on the internet. Um, the last mile is essentially a, a coding program as it stands today. Um, that exists in, in America's prison system. So uh, the general concept is, you know, recidivism rates, depending on the state, are anywhere from 55 to 75%. So if you imagine someone making a mistake and ending up in prison and remaining in that system their entire lives, or a vast majority of it, 55 to 75% of the time, that's a problem. Um, 
And unfortunately, not to get into any sort of political discussion uh, on the show, but uh, unfortunately, our society has gotten to a point where private prisons are a thing. Lobbyists who are very well paid on the private prison industry behalf um, have a lot of influence, and uh, they want to keep the system that way because it makes the money to do so. Uh, and, and I find that frustrating. So what they have found is people in prison who have a career of getting out, if you teach them a legitimate job skill, and I don't mean stamping license plate frames, uh, basically for free, uh, but giving them you know, job skills that might pull them out of an economic situation that led them to prison in the first place, um, that they have a 0% recidivism rate. So every graduate of the last mile program that started at San Bernardino prison, um, I'm sorry, San Quentin in uh, California, not a single member or graduate of that program has ever gone back to jail. And I think that's amazing. And it makes total sense to me that if you teach people tech skills that lend themselves to a worthwhile career, um, their program is pretty, pretty strenuous too. It's an entire year of basically two semesters, um, just like college. Um, they're taught multiple languages per semester. And as you can imagine, with a lot of time on their hands, um, they end up being able to learn quite a bit, despite the fact that they are not allowed to access the internet in prison. So the last mile built their own sort of private um, uh, private cloud idea of a development uh, environment. So every prison has its own uh, air gap dev environment that these folks operate in. Uh, so if you imagine how many times you get stuck trying to figure out a script or figure out a command and how you're able to do it, they can't do that. So they have to figure it all out the, the hard way, trial and error or going back to the books. Um, they don't have the option to Google it and copy paste someone else's work. So um, I think it's amazing that they are providing people a livelihood. Um, it's not just the teaching of coding, but also a partnership program with um, various tech companies who are willing to overlook um, a checkered past and in partnership with the last mile believe that they're going to get good employees um, out of the partnership with that program. So uh, they hire graduates from the last mile. Um, started in California, quickly spread across the country. My local uh, last mile um, outreach efforts have been at Topeka Correctional Facility, correctional about an hour, hour and 15 minutes from here. Um, they don't have a cybersecurity program yet, and uh, yet they invited me to come out there and talk to a group of women, incarcerated women, about what it's like to work in InfoSec and how I got there and what interests me about it. And they were the most engaged crowd of people that I've talked to in many years. Um, they asked amazing questions. Um, they were very bright and inquisitive young women. And um, they asked if I would come back. I offered to pick up a collection of various InfoSec books, textbooks, since they don't have internet access, um, to bring back to them, if that's something they'd be interested in. Um, and then, you know, with the ignorance of thinking, I'm the first one to think of this, I reached out to Last Mile Leadership and said, hey, why don't we work together to create an InfoSec program? And they were like, yeah, we're already working with a Cisco partnership, so, so sit down and chat. But the local folks in Topeka were happy to host me. Um, I do want to shout out as well the guys from Cisco Talos. Um, I reached out and said, hey, do you guys have any old InfoSec textbooks? And they actually took up a collection for me. Uh, and sent me boxes on boxes of, of awesome books. Unfortunately, they did that right as COVID quarantine shutdown happened. So I have not been able as of yet to deliver those um, because I'm not allowed to go back into the prison yet with that many people in an indoor space um, and present to them again. But as soon as I can, um, I will be happily awarding uh, boxes on boxes of InfoSec textbooks from the Talos guys. So thank you, Cisco Talos for doing that. I'm sure they will be thrilled to see this. So that is the second uh, charity that I care about. So please go donate to those folks. And if there's a local chapter in your area, please volunteer to go talk to them or mentor them or help out in some way because you're just making the world a better place. Is there any way we could do something with like the career hacking village? That would be awesome. I mean, because one of their primary, um, you know, missions, one of the primary 
services they offer is the pairing of graduates from their program, talented, educated, um, able to code right out of the gate, graduates of their program with companies that are willing to hire folks despite the fact that they've been to prison. And I would think in the InfoSec community, that would be true in spades. I think that that's... we're all a little bit different. <laughs> I, uh, I think that's a worthwhile conversation we should follow up and uh, talk about with the career hacking folks. Yeah, absolutely. My seat is resting, by the way. I still got 12 minutes on my potatoes, so I'm going to. Um, if folks on the call aren't familiar with why you want to let meat rest after you cook it, um, this is not only true of steak, but also of chicken. Um, it's you want to let the juices redistribute. <coughs> Cooking on one side or the other, you want to let the juices redistribute. So that they don't all ooze out immediately. Um, you will also find in some cases that the meat will continue to cook as the juices redistribute. If you want to accelerate that process, which you particularly will want to do sometimes, um, you could wrap it in foil and it will continue to elevate the temperature. Um, and if you're unsure at first about how to get a steak done to your you know level of liking, um, meat thermometer is a great way to go. Once you start doing that regularly and you get a feel for it. Um, I can tell by the level of squishiness of my steak, steak from my species, whether it's too done or not done enough. Really thinking it's not done enough. Well, I got some done french fries. Yay! Yes! And nice. I'm fighting with my aluminum foil because I'm going to do the parchment paper trick the next time. <laughs> Have we had any questions in chat or anything you want me to address? Uh, we had some questions about um, from people showing up late about what uh, is in your French martini. Um, but no, no, just lots of general comments. No, no questions. Okay. Uh, um, I flashed a few of them across the, uh, the screen as they came up. Oh, my bad. I wasn't watching the screen. Um, so my French martini, for folks who put up late, is uh, pretty straightforward. It's uh, one part Chambord, a black raspberry liqueur. So I'll do one shot of this. Um, and then it's two parts vodka. I use kettle one. And then two parts pineapple juice. And then bacon, like it owes you money. You should get a nice uh, foam on top a little bit. Um, you forget, fair warning, these are a little bit dangerous. And you forget they're mostly alcohol. So uh, something I've been experimenting with um, the past couple of weeks is, as it's gotten colder, is I brew tea. And then I have been um, mixing tea with, uh, I've done two different recipes. I did one uh, with green tea. Um, what did I do that one with? Oh, that one was green tea honey, uh, whiskey, and lime juice. Nice. And it was fantastic. And it was served nice and warm, and I was outside. Um, the one I just did on Monday was jasmine tea. And I did that one with a dark rum. Very nice. I have a dark rum around here somewhere. Some Baron Samedi dark rum. Yeah, as the weather gets colder, I will more often uh, occasionally make a hot chocolate and then um, pour into it some combination of salted caramel Kahlua, mint mocha Kahlua, let me get in the camera frame, there you go, or uh, the traditional Baileys. And then I also have, especially if it's a weekend, um, I like to bust out the rum chata shots that come in handy. Rum chata shots? Yeah, they come in handy travel creamer size. Oh, here we go, it's in the corner. So rum chata. However, they come in these handy, tiny creamer size, clearly oh. intended to be dumped in your coffee. I'm just using it for its intended purpose, mm. not because I'm an alcoholic. Uh, so they're delicious. If you've not had rum chata before, you can also put this in tea. Um, I've had folks tell me they put it in a tea and in hot chocolate. Um, it's Caribbean rum with dairy creamer, basically. 
So, nice way to spice up your Saturday morning coffee. Not trying to get a little buzzed and go talk to customers during the week, but on the weekend, makes a nice combination with some early morning Call of Duty. So how do I stop myself from eating all the steak while I'm waiting? <laughs> so you marinated yours for 24 hours, yeah? You, can you yep. taste it? It's good, right? Yeah. Yeah, I should probably cut into mine. It's been resting for some minutes now. I can't help it. I love ribeye. I know it's bad for you because of the fat content, or blah, 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 but it's so good. Fatty parts are the good parts. That's how all meat works. Yeah, so I'm just gonna be here eating steak until uh, you you <laughs> take the next step. So I got six and a half minutes left on my fries. In the interim, this is the cheese that I use when it comes time for the cheese. Yeah, Mexican cheese. Oaxaca. Oaxaca. And Ozadero. And then I also like, I know it's craft grown, but um, it's infused with Philadelphia cream cheese. Oh, you get that like creamy, like the way it melts. Yeah. So it's just a Mexican blend of Monterey Jack, cheddar, Asadero, and queso quesadilla cheeses, but it's infused with cream cheese. So I'll use a combination of this. Uh, for the purposes of entertainment, I'll use my shredder, shredder, to shred my cheese. I'm a child of the 80s. Yeah, no, every time I think of Shredder, I think of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's Shredder from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Why did Shredder? Oh, shredder. he's on the top. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see that. <laughs> this is my Shredder Shredder. Can I can I do the the ice vanilla the vanilla ice song while you're doing it? <laughs> Please. Go Ninja, go Ninja, go. Go Ninja, go Ninja, go. <laughs> I hope you see my dog looking at me right now like I'm insane. I'm doing the Go Ninja, go dance with you. He's like, what What the fuck is going on? This is Archer. He thinks I'm insane. He's like, I don't know what's going on, Mom, but I smell steak. I know. I'm ridiculous, right? I have way too many complete conversations with my pets. I don't know if any of my ingredients are going to survive the final assembly. <laughs> I mean, you'll lose a little something, but not much. Tasting them together is nice, but whatever. Whatever switch with that, man. All right, let me open up these cheeses. Be ready. My fries will be done. So, really, you can do this in any order you like once your fries are done. But I, as I've stated many times before, am really obnoxiously retentive about the relative doneness of my steak. And thus, I will put cheese on fries first, back in the oven to melt the cheese. That's where a majority of the cheese comes in. All right, so the fries go in the pan. Fries go in the cast iron skillet. You got one handy. That's why I really like using a cast iron skillet for this recipe, because it works both on the stove and in the oven. All right, and then we'll put but, cheese on. Yep, put cheese on and throw it in the oven, the still hot oven, to melt. Once that is melted, pull it out and then cube up your steak and put the steak on top of it. And then put a final, much lighter layer of cheese on top and put it back in the oven just long enough to melt that final layer of cheese without overcooking or cooking. Them. All right, so wait to cube or I cube now? You can cube whenever, as long as it's rested. You cube your, your ass Oh, off. it's rested. I have eaten half of it, so yeah. it's definitely... So whatever's left. They're not only rested, it survived. <laughs> Cube the shit out of whatever's left, man. <laughs> oh my goodness. Can someone that's watching live, like Ben, maybe uh, update us on the presidential race? If I, my hands are full, would love to know if either Arizona or Nevada has been officially called. And if not, it's okay. It can be a pleasant surprise for when we're done. 
uh, we got a shout out about your marinade. I'm assuming people are Googling at the moment. Oh, was it Ben? Yep. Yeah. It said marinade's delicious. Oh, I'm glad. So Ben, uh, being a faithful servant of our electorate, busy yesterday from 4 a.m. until well into the night. So I bought a two pack of ribeye and marinated both bags and dropped him off his so his was pre pre-made for him Novato is re Novato Nevada Nevada is reporting tomorrow a.m. nothing new all right with 86 percent of the votes in Biden was ahead but I thought we'd be there I changed their mind about that while we were working quite all right Cuban in a mistake. I feel like there should be a Cuban your steak song um, that we should write right now. I feel like YMCA is the closest thing to that. Why is that because of the meat implication? Yep, that's where I went with that. <laughs> yeah. oh. Steak MCA. <laughs> You're so embarrassing. I can't even. <laughs> <laughs> I have no shame. This is part of what makes me a good host. It is. It's part of why we get along. I, too, have no shame. <sighs> um, Bryson, are you pounding seltzer or beer? <laughs> um, I am now on to a Goose Island lager called mm. Natural Villain. <laughs> I mean... That's quite, that's quite the on-the-nose choice there, Bryson. <laughs> hey, I was originally just drinking the regular Goose Island IPA. It's just IPA. It was the next thing I grabbed. All right. Well, if you're going to drink beer, now that this one is empty, I'll drink beer. Mm -hmm. My cheese is getting all melty. Mm. That's what it's supposed to do. Oh, my friend is in. All right, timer, pipe down. All right, so this is Boulevard Tank 7. It is the best beer that has ever been concocted in the entirety of human history. Is that a local beer? Yes and no. Uh, Boulevard is a local brewery, but they've been bought by InBev, so they're, they're pretty big. Um, you can find them in a lot of places now, whereas before you could only get them in this area but you can get them in chicago have can confirm you can get these in chicago now uh, so get, given that InBev is a giant international beer distributing company i'm sure you can get them just about anywhere i have not seen that before i will have to search that out um although back to the veteran thing i was a tank commander um, so i've been in a real tank so this is in reference to one of their brewing tanks they used to have a, a tank tank number seven that was very uh temperamental and they happened to get this one particular brew out of it that they really liked and figured out how to replicate it. So this is named after their cantankerous, pun intended, tank. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but waiter, there's a fly in my soup. All right, let me pull these fries. I mean, I, I have to think about this. Real tank, tank in a brewery. I know which one I prefer, although the idea of firing from a tank, given how many video games that I've played over the years in which I pretended to fire from a tank, I think would be pretty awesome. Um, it's like the best thing ever. <laughs> like no contest. I mean, I can buy beer anywhere. Like, fuck it. I don't need a tank. Like a real tank, though, that's something else. Uh, so you see how easily this comes off the parchment paper? This is one of the reasons to do parchment paper. You go, bruh, bruh, bruh. I learned my lesson. Yeah, bruh. thank you. Wait, now you're just showing off. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know what? I, I'm throwing my cubes in and I'm pouring more cheese on. <laughs> All right, let me get my cast iron back. Considering yeah. I've eaten almost half the steak, it's going to be mostly cheese at this point. <laughs> yeah, but it's the principle of the thing. <laughs> Thank you, Puppy. Thank you. All right. 
dump these pies in a cast iron skillet that we use to make the steak because we're leaving it all like these dishes. Discussed previously. I'm trying to spread it out in a consistent ish layer along the bottom. And then we're going to stretch some trees. All right, Shredder from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, whose head just came off. Technically, you're not supposed to put him in the dishwasher. I've definitely done that before. So his head is not so consistently attached to his body. But it's fine. Because the cheese still tastes delicious. So I'm a huge fan of Oaxaca. As anyone who's ever seen me cook can probably surmise. So I'm going to show that first. Oh, Shredder. Set shredder set aside for a moment because it doesn't want to stay on. I like a cheese blend. We'll do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Now we go with the asadero. A lot of people ask me, like, where do you get these cheeses? Like, they're super exotic because they're Mexican cheese, dude. The grocery store. Every grocery store has some kind of ethnic food dial. That's where I will direct your attention. If for some reason you live in an area remote enough that they don't have an ethnic food dial where they have these cheeses, that's okay. Just seek yourself out a Mexican supermarket. Can you do you actually get the Oaxaca to to, to melt? Because when I've worked with it, it's usually like hard and salty and it doesn't really melt. Oh, that's not a Oaxaca then. This oh. is very soft cheese by definition. It's super oh. soft and malleable and yeah. It melts very nicely. So what you're probably thinking of is either um, quesadilla cheese. Quesadilla cheese ends up uh, tends to be kind of harder and more brittle, um, or ta, or something along those lines. Uh, I, I ate my last bit of it, so I don't have it for reference. I will. <laughs> I will get back to you. Like this has been in the pan for less than ten seconds, and it's pretty melty and stringy. So. Oh. Yeah. Mexican mozzarella. Got it. Pretty much. <laughs> it's very accurate, actually. All right. So we're going to add some of this Mexican blend. And again, cheat mode infused with Philadelphia cream cheese. And then we will put this in the oven for melty purposes. This is hot. Oh, we're good. Definitely have been using my non enamel coated handle. Um, cast iron skillet and been drinking maybe a little much and cooking. I'm sure you find that shocking. And uh, have forgotten to check the handle and grabbed it full on oven temperature. <laughs> Just whoop, like an idiot. And then we can serve the rest of this cheese for another day. Yes, funky. I know you can smell stick. Here's some cheese. Always save a few bites of the steak for doggos. If you look this one who thinks he's sneaky, look at him just <laughs> half his face. Just soon, soon, soon. Look at him. <laughs> he's wagging his tail because he knows I'm talking about him. Archer, you're ridiculous. I love your dumb face. All right. I am sufficiently melty. Melty. All right. We'll put your cubed up steak on top. And then if you want, I, because I love cheese, will add a final, very thin layer of additional shredded cheese on top of that and then stick it back in the oven. But again, being cautious to not add too much so that you are in a position where you have to leave it in the oven long enough that it cooks your steak further, because I don't want that. It, you may not mind. I'm very sensitive about the relative doneness of my steak. Nope, I'm eating my steak too. Okay. All right. Oh, that's all melting. Other dogs. This is Punky. 
Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, you're very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Was it Penny? She's down here supervising. Yes. You're on camera. Very cute. And then, if you note, the shadowy figure in the background is Veronica Corningstone. This is my kitty cat who's stalking us from the top of the stairs going to the basement. Because there's steak and play. And she's pretty sure she's a dog when it comes to begging for steak. All right. I am finished. Mm. Awesome. I'd like to add a dressing on top. Spicy guacamole. My local deli counter actually makes a pretty mean spicy guacamole, so I usually buy theirs to skip a step. They also make a pretty nice pico de gallo, so I will dress it up on top with guac and pico and then a little sour cream. And then I like to garnish with either some, I don't know, depends on how fancy I'm feeling, a little, if I have a little cilantro left from the marinade or some fresh shredded parsley a teensy bit or some powdered um, parm, something, just a little something extra on top. All right, we are melted on the cheese. I did a pico de gallo, fresh cilantro, uh, diced raw, red onions, and um, sour cream. Dope. All right, so this is the melted cheese in the pan. If you can see that, I'm trying to let the camera catch up. Maybe I'll turn this light off. I don't know if that helps. That helps a little bit. Yeah, it looks good. Yep. All right, so I'll add my stick. Stick, snick, stop snick. All right. Uh, on the top. Oh, yeah. It's looking good. And then, just for good measure, a bit of shredded cheese on top. I'm going to go back in the oven for like. Definitely. Stupid hot Ben uh, did a fried egg on his. I think that's a nice touch. It's funny. I was actually thinking about that. Well done. You know, my proclivity for a fried egg on things. Very handy. That's darn good. Okay. I'm going to get to melt the last little bit of cheese. And then we're done. And I'll just put the dressing business on top. The Walk and peek on the carpet. Well, Ben, you have no excuse not to post pictures of your creation. <laughs> Half of it was done for you. So we'd love to see it. Hashtag Unicorn Chef. And everyone else, of course, please share what you're cooking. Because I think the neatest thing about all this is everybody making the same thing and how different it always comes out. Yes, I'm a fan of smelling what the rock is cooking. Please share. Nope. I get really impatient. Melting cheese in the oven. We should think of a thing to do to encourage people to donate to the charities that are the subject of the cooking show that week. Like, I don't know what, a personalized unicorn chef apron or a, I don't know. Oh, I could send people, not that I made them, but um, Alyssa was kind enough at one point to send me a shipment of these wicked good cupcakes that are pre-made cupcakes in a jar. Yep. They're freaking delicious. It made my day when she sent these. So, I don't know, something. Whoever the top donator is, send them a shipment of cupcakes with a dumb picture of my face. Something. All right, you heard it, folks. Are you watching? Uh, we will check at the end of November and the top donation uh, to either of those charities. Let us know. We will hook you up with something. Uh, the Wicked Cupcakes, that's actually what we use at Scythe for our presents. Well, I hear your tribunal. You can see mine. We got Archer still stalking me in the background. I don't know where my, oh, there she is. Come here. 
Talking getting closer. Yes, hi. Yeah. You see my dog. Right there. Up open. Yep. I got one right here that looks kind of like yours. Yeah. Although she she, like she has not been shy. She has been around my feet for half of this. Yes. She's like, what's there? I want some. That's what this one does. She just likes to trip me. Maybe the death of me one day. Yeah, we're milky enough for my teeth. All right, there it is. So heavy. And we are fiend. Now all I have to do is put some fun things on top. Let's take a picture real quick first. Because it tends to get obscured by the guac and the pico. I don't know how long my final plating is going to last. I'm eating it. <laughs> you should. Wow, but the, we got to finish with the picture. <laughs> I'm eating the picture. <laughs> My local grocery store's block is so legit. Spicy as hell up it. I, I was just getting you in the shot. There's no food for you. <laughs> She's yes. sitting around underneath me. She's like, yeah, and? <laughs> Your food is my food, Dad. That's how it works. Yes, I know you can smell the steak, dogs, all three of you. I get it. If you don't want to be lazy like me and cheat with this pre-made spicy block and pre-made pico, I do actually have a pretty solid recipe for pico and uh, another one for guac, but they're all pretty much the same, right? It's like Dice up some potatoes and a red on, or potatoes, some tomatoes and a red onion and um, maybe a jalapeno or two and uh, add, you know, cilantro and all of your usual dressings and whatnot. But because they're all about the same, in my opinion, I like to save time by buying these from my local dog. They are fresh made and they are delightful. And then sour cream on that because everything delicious has sour cream in it. All right. And then usually I will stand over the stove and eat this with a fork from the pan like a hobo. Because it's just me. Why put it on a plate and dirty a plate? Well. All we got to do is get a picture of us with the final food, and we are okay. free to hobo it up. <laughs> All right, I got my, my parsley garnish, put my parm garnish on it, and then we're good. Uh, I need my screenshot. Set up. Boom. Hold up. All right. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. All right. Well, let me see if I can get a better shot of it, maybe with the light off. I'm trying not to burn myself. <laughs> yes, that would be bad. Ready when you are? All right. Ah! Yay! So, cheers. Cheers. Thank you to everybody joining us tonight for Unicorn Chef. Um, please donate to Lena. Veterans Community Project and the Last Mile, because they are the shit. And let us know your donations. And at the end of the month, we'll send the top donator something. Um, ah. Hashtag Unicorn Chef for sharing all of your creations, because we always like to see what you make. And look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.